Like many of the towns and villages in South Kerry, Balneskelix faces the sea and is overshadowed by mountains. The whole area is full of historic monuments, some dating back thousands of years. In this video though, I will mainly focus on Balneskelix Castle and Abbey. However, before moving on to this, it is worth pointing out that Balneskelix Bay is strongly associated with Gaelic mythology. It is identified as Inverskena where Amurgan and the other sons of Mill are reputed to have landed in Ireland. In other words, it is part of the origin myth of the Gaelic people and identified them as the place where they landed in Ireland. Moreover, many of the ancient monuments in this area have been incorporated in this mythology, such as Iktakua Stone Row, said to be the burial place of Skena, wife of Amurgan, and the woman who Inverse Skena is named after. For a video about this, click here. Although Balanskelix Bay is somewhat sheltered, Balanskelix Abbey has still been battered by the Atlantic. Indeed, much of it was swallowed by the sea before the building of the seawall. Fortunately, since the latter was constructed, the rest of the monastery has been preserved. The abbey, or better the priory, dates from early in the 12th century possibly being founded in 1210. As in so many other places though, the information about its foundation can be confusing, contradictory or just wrong. However, the reason for its construction is well known. The monastic settlement and the nearby Skellig Michael was abandoned and transferred here instead. This move was not surprising, as life on the Skelligs had always been very difficult. Interestingly, the Abbey kept possession of the Skelligs until its closure at the end of the 16th century. Well, the Skelligs was an Augustinian priory, or more specifically, it was held by the Erosian canons of the Order of St. Augustine. These were one of the various types of Augustinian monks and were quite common in Ireland. They are reputed to have come from Ratut in North Kerry to found Balna Skelligs. These canons still held the Abbey at the time of its dissolution in the late 16th century. However, some believe that the abbey was first occupied by regular Augustinian canons who actually came from an abbey in Milltown. In the later medieval period, the position of prior, the head of the priory, came to be held by the old Mulcrony family, in an almost dynastic manner. This dynastic-like secession was relatively common in the Gaelic church. The first Omulcrony prior seems to have been Alan Omulcrony in 1411. Afterwards, the family held a position for most of the 15th century, despite some problems with accusations against them in the 1470s. The last Omulcrony prior was Tadeus, being appointed to this position in 1505. It is not known when the monks left the abbey. It seems to have still been in use in 1555 and perhaps even later. During the reign of Queen Elizabeth, most Catholic abbeys and religious houses would be closed down as Protestantism became the official religion in Ireland and religious lands were seen as a way to make money for the crown or to reward certain people. As it was far from Dublin and in the middle of the McCarthy Moor Lordship, Balneskelix Abbey was initially somewhat sheltered from this, but ultimately would suffer the same fate. Officially, it was closed in 1578 when it was granted to someone called Giles Clincher, afterwards passing through other English settlers until it came into the possession of the Sigerson family in 1615. However, it is possible that the monks remained there later than 1578, perhaps even to the 1590s, since in the Desmond survey, a survey of the McCarthy Moore holdings carried out around 1597, the Priory of Balneskelix paid McCarthy Moore, Sorin, from the Irish Sorhain or maintenance, equivalent to five marks or four pounds, eight shillings, eight pence and two white groats. Today, the abbey consists of the remnants of the church, the refectory and ruined cloister, a building called the Prior's House, another building called the Castle or Cashlon Björg, and the ruins of some other domestic buildings. 
All these date from somewhere between the 13th and 15th centuries. Only the prior's house is in a good state of conservation, though even this is missing its roof. Like many other medieval churches and abbeys, it is now used as a graveyard. Although some of the graves are modern, others are old. Many are unmarked, while there are also ten large house-shaped tombs. The church is of a type similar to what can be found in many other abbeys and priories in the region. Namely, it is divided into a nave and chancel. The nave is the main part of the church where the congregation gathered, while the chancel is a space around the altar, reserved for the clergy and the choir. In Balanskelix, much of the chancel is destroyed, as is the sacristy. Both were consumed by the sea, along with other parts of the abbey. The gable of the church facing the sea once had a large window, probably one with several lancet windows, in other words, small arched windows, which are commonly found in Irish abbeys. This too has fallen into the sea, sometime in the late 19th century. The nave measures 16.6 metres by 4.9 metres internally. Along with other parts of the priory, it has been restored by the OPW, who are doing their best to preserve the ruins against the power of the Atlantic storms. In the division between the nave and the chancel, the chancel arch still survives to full height. It's topped by a type of belfry. As mentioned, most of the chancel has been destroyed, along with what was once the sacristy. Behind the church is the building known as the Prior's House. This is the best preserved building in the Abbey. It is a two-story rectangular building measuring 11.7 metres by 6.6 .6 metres internally, although the upper floor is long gone. On average, the walls are 4 metres high and 1 metre thick. Inside it are stored various elements of stonework found during restoration. These are quite interesting to look at, since they illustrate different aspects of stonework, highlighting some of the skills involved in constructing a building like this. Little remains of the other buildings, such as the cloister or the refectory. In fact, all that is left of these are some walls. Most of the area they formerly occupied is now taken up with graves. Even less remains of the castle or the Cachelon Bjog. Just some walls and the ground floor appear. Nevertheless, it still has a castle-like appearance, looking like the tower houses which appeared all over Ireland at the end of the medieval period. Little is known about it. It is possible that it was built later than the rest of the buildings. It may have been the prior's residence, though this is speculation. It also may have been built as protection, but the question remains, protection against whom? Now let us turn to the castle. Little is actually known about it. While there are considerable historical references to the abbey, there is almost nothing about the castle. In a way, this is not surprising, as this small castle, a small tower house really, was not very important. It does not appear to have been the seat of a lord. Rather, it was most likely a guardhouse. In the 16th century, there were large herring shoals close to the Irish coast. Many of these were caught by Spanish and French fishermen. Quite often, these would have to land to salt their catch. The Gaelic lords along the southwest coast of Ireland profited from this, imposing taxes on these sailors, in other words, charges to use the area. Some Gaelic lords did extremely well from this. Balneskelis Castle may well have housed a small group of soldiers who collected these charges on behalf of McCarthy Moore, the overlord of Evera, actually of Desmond, which consisted of South Kerry and West Cork. However, the castle was also more than just a guardhouse. It would also have been a symbolic representation of the power of the lord who built it, showing that this was his area, his land, and that his power reached there. After the downfall of the McCarthy Moore Lordship, Balneskelix ended up in the possession of the Sigerson family, 
from around 1616 onwards. They appear to have resided in the castle for a period and may also have altered it, perhaps even constructing external buildings or other structures. Photos taken at the beginning of the 20th century show the existence of external lean-to structures. These no longer exist and could well have been built in the later 19th century. The castle itself is long abandoned, but fortunately has withstood the Atlantic climate reasonably well. It is beautifully located on a narrow spit of land sticking out from Balneskellig's beach, only a few hundred metres away from the abbey. It's a small castle, measuring 10.35 metres by 8.25 metres externally. Originally it had three storeys. Each storey seems to have had the same basic structure, namely a main chamber with an adjoining mural passageway. Like many castles, it has a battered base. In other words, the bottom of the wall sticks out a little. It has a maximum height of 7.65 metres, though this is only in one corner of the castle where what looks like a remnant of a tower stands. Perhaps the most beautiful aspect of the castle is the main doorway. This arched doorway faces the sea, or rather, it frames the sea, and undoubtedly has been in many paintings and photos. After the doorway is a small lintel passageway, above which there is a murder hole, again something very common in castles from this period, and used to stop people who are not wanted from entering. On one side of the passage is a small cell-like room, possibly a guard room. In the early 19th century it was reported as being called Chomre en Verdouille. On the other side are the stairs leading to the upper floors. Unfortunately, access to the upper floors is no longer possible as a locked gate bars the way. The first exit from the stairs enters a type of gallery looking over the internal part of the castle. This is really the passage to enter the first floor chamber. There was a wooden floor here at one time, but this has disappeared, taking the chamber with it, though the sockets which held the wooden floor still remain and can be seen in the walls. Little of the second floor remains, basically just part of the walls, which in one corner are slightly higher, making it appear like a tower. Now the second floor has the appearance of a type of rampart. Probably these walls were originally higher. It's also very possible that the second story had a wooden roof originally and a wooden floor, but these have been lost. When it was possible to reach the top of the castle, there was a brilliant view of Balneskellig's Bay and the surrounding region from there. Hopefully, in the future, it may be possible to climb up on top of the castle again and to see this view. As I've already mentioned, little is known about the castle. Despite its name, it is not known if it actually was a McCarthy castle, though I suspect it was. Due to the Desmond survey, we have a good idea of land ownership in Desmond or Evera in the 1590s. From this, the castle would appear to have been built on church land, in other words, the land of the priory. However, in Gaelic custom, they still had to pay a former tax to McCarthy Moore. As mentioned, the priory had to pay him soren or maintenance every year. On the other hand, in the Desmond survey, another McCarthy sept, Schlucht Owen Vore of Cushmain, held two quarters of land by the River Kern and the haven of Balneskellix. Of course, the Desmond survey is a snapshot of a very dynamic picture yet it does help us understand landholding patterns. It is possible that the haven of Balneskellix could have been near the castle and abbey. Was the castle then built by Schlucht Owen Vore? Perhaps, but it is also possible, and even more likely, that it was a McCarthy Moore construction, imposed on the Priory's land to keep an eye on the valuable fishery nearby, and also collect money from foreign fishermen landing to salt their catch. It's impossible to know for sure, but this is one of the perils of anything involved with history. We can never know everything about the past. 
What we have is fragments or pieces which we have to interpret as best we can. Balnus Gellix thus offers us an interesting light into different aspects of the past. The abbey and the castle are buildings which illustrate Gaelic political and religious life, important elements of a culture that was destroyed several centuries ago. In a way, they enable us to peer backwards in time, giving us clues about life in this part of Kerry several hundred years ago.